right, we are in business. Okay, everyone. Uh, one last adjustment. There we go. All right. So welcome, welcome to uh, welcome back to call. And so nice to to be back and uh, welcome to our course introduction to cosmology. Uh, cosmology is a branch of astronomy or astrophysics. Nowadays, there's not much of a difference between the two. And um, the one simple definition, a short definition of cosmology is that it deals with the structure and evolution of the universe. So a big topic. <clears throat> and uh, it's always nice to start out with this very, very incredible picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. There's been a number of these. There's been the deep field and the uh, very deep field. And here we have uh, the ultra deep field. Uh, most of you know what this is, uh, have seen this before. This is a tiny patch of the sky, which looks dark to us, just with our naked eye. It actually looks dark, even if you were to look through uh, an amateur uh, telescope, uh, kind of a very modest, small telescope. There's nothing to see here. Uh, but you put the Hubble on it, and um, you let the Hubble watch this thing for days and days in the same spot, and uh, this is what you get. Uh, I think here I wrote down exactly the specs for where this comes from. Uh, and uh, it is uh, 800 exposures taken with 40 orbits of the Hubble spacecraft around the Earth, going back around and around and around. Uh, looking for a total of 11.3 days. This was taken uh, in, uh, uh, over the span of 2003, 2004. And this is what you get. Uh, everything that we're seeing here, these are not stars, right? These are galaxies. Um, and uh, these are galaxies which just are further and further away, uh, the dimmer they are. Um, the galaxies which are red, are even further away than the galaxies which are gray or white. Uh, and that is because of the redshift, which we'll talk a lot about during our course. So this is 10,000 galaxies that Hubble can see by watching the same spot and letting that light just build and build and build um, on the camera. So it's just quite an amazing thing to think about that this is just a tiny patch of the sky I think this patch is so small, it would take a million of these patches to cover, uh, to cover the sky. That's how small this is. A very, usually when you see this, uh, compared to the full moon, it's a very small, tiny little piece um, of the full moon. So uh, something to kind of start off uh, our thinking about, about cosmology. But here's another one. We are looking at the structure and evolution uh, of the universe. I like to make an analogy um, to the theory of evolution where um, sort of in modern biology, we can study the structure uh, of the modern horse, uh, the uh, genus Equus, and learn all about its anatomy and its physiology. But the theory of evolution should, uh, by looking through the fossil record and using theory like molecular biology, theoretical concepts like the natural selection and adaptation, we should be able to actually explain and describe the evolution up to the modern horse. Theory of evolution should be able to do that using these other biological theories uh, as support. And even if we could trace, which would be almost impossible to do, but if we could in fact trace all the influencing factors, like all the environmental changes that the horse and its uh, family have been subjected to over its great uh, history, we can see the history there on the left, measured in millions of years, starting with 55 million years, going up the tree of evolution. If in fact you could trace all those influences, which I imagine is impossible, the theory, well, it's a biological theory, but in theory, you sh the theory should be able to actually predict what the anatomy and the physiology of the horse would be today. Now that's a tall order for biology, and I'm not a biologist, but I don't think that's a very, very realistic to be able to actually predict everything there is to know about the anatomy and physiology of the horse. Certainly some things very much can be predicted and have been 
would be predicted by the theory of evolution about, about the horse. So that's the analogy that I want to look at coming to our study of the structure and evolution of the, uh, of the universe. I've taken the same words, the theory of the Big Bang, using the analysis of images of the earlier universes, general theories, theories of, of physics that we'll be using like relativity and high energy particle physics, theoretical concepts within the theory of, 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 uh, of the Big Bang like inflation, which we'll have a lot to talk about. You can see that here in the picture. Here's inflation, the inflation era, the very beginning of our story. You should be able to describe and explain the evolutionary processes that lead up to today's universe. We first of all have to have an understanding of what today's universe does look like, but if we have that, um, then this theory should be able to describe and explain how we got to where we are today. And using the same words as with the horse, if all the influencing factors like environmental changes could be continually traced, then this theory of the Big Bang actually should be able to predict what the structure and the, uh, uh, and of, the, of the universe should be today. Now, this is a physical theory. We're talking here about physics and astrophysics. So this should do a better job in predicting than in a biological theory. First of all, this theory is not as complex <laughs> as biological theories. There is nothing more complex in the universe than a, than a, than a biological organism. Uh, but here, using physics, using, although it may sound strange in a way, simpler systems than biological systems, we actually have a much better chance of literally predicting from the theory and from the fossil record of the universe looking back further and further in time, like that Hubble ultrafield, looking at very, very, very early uh, um, galaxies and how they evolved, we actually should be able to predict what the universe is like today. That's what we're going to try to do here in our course. We're going to try to describe essentially the Big Bang theory, go into in some detail the theory of the Big Bang and see if we can actually predict from that theory and all of its evolutionary stages, which we see here in front of us, if we can actually predict what the universe looks like today. Of course, we need to know what the universe looks like today. That's where we're gonna start our story. We'll start our story by spending uh, today, next, next week, perhaps even one more, on looking at what the universe looks like today. But today we're, today we're going to just take kind of a broad historical view of things. Let me stop for a minute and, um, and mention one of the um, um, uh, attachments that I sent in my email, that data sheet. Uh, I hope it didn't scare too many people. Uh, some people are not all that crazy about numbers and formulas. I absolutely get that. But what I did with the data sheet, I simply just went through the presentation. This presentation here was when it was finished. And I just went through and found all the important numbers that I've used. And here I'm looking at the first page of the sheet. If you may have printed it out yourself, we have here, I've got four numbers that I, that, that I found that I thought was worthy of writing down. The astronomical unit, the distance from the earth to the sun, <clears throat> conventionally known as 93 million miles, kind of one of those numbers everyone should know. Um, and um, uh, I'm sorry, five numbers, so the speed of light, uh, one of the most important constants uh, 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 in, in nature. You have the astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. We have a light year, a much, much greater distance. And we have the two uh, extreme uh, wavelengths of light. Uh, we'll be talking so much about spectra and red shifts and things like that. And it's good to have a, uh, some kind of an idea of what kind of numbers we're talking about. So violet light, the shortest wavelength uh, would be 400 nanometers, 10 to the minus nine, all the way up to red light, <clears throat> longer of 700 nanometers. So I have a little box up on top there uh, reminding you of, of how to put words to these exponents. Um, if you see something to 10 to the third, that's in thousands, and something with 10 to the sixth, is in millions, that's one in six zeros. 
10 to the 9th is a billion, 10 to the 12th is a trillion, and 10 to the 15th, I don't know if that has uh, a conventional name. I know maybe as kids we used to call that a quadrillion, but I'm not sure if that's a real, a real name anymore. But there are real names that scientists do use, and that's on the left-hand side, where thousands is kilo, like a kilogram, like a kilometer, a thousand meters, and mega, a million, giga, uh, gigabytes uh, in our computers, uh, uh, terabytes uh, per trillion. And for 10 to the 15th, we do have a very respectable name, Penta, and this actually even goes up beyond uh, 10 to the 15th. There are other names which I didn't bother to, to show. Going down on the other side, having smaller and smaller numbers, and we'll be looking at very small numbers because we'll be looking at high energy particle physics as one of the theories that we need to explain the model of the Big Bang. We have similarly 10 to the minus three would be one over 10 to the three, 1,000th to minus six would be a, 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 a millionth, 10 to the minus nine is a billion. And you can see the wavelengths of light is uh, in nanometers, that's 400 times 10 to the minus nine would be nanometers, 10 to the minus 12th is pico. And finally, 10 to the minus 15th, um, one over 10 to the 15th is a femto uh, unit. So I thought that might be helpful uh, to, uh, to, to take a look at that. In terms of the speed of light, uh, you could read that as three times 10 to the eighth. That's also three times 10 to the sixth. So that would be 300 million right, meters per second. Uh, for an astronomical unit, 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. Take off those two, make it from 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 9th. So that will be 150 billion meters is the distance that 93 million miles turns out to be 150 um, million, a billion meters and, and so on. So you can turn these uh, exponents into words if you, if you find that helpful. Just take a look at that astronomical unit before we leave this page to see that I've given it in light years. It takes eight minutes for the light to get from the sun down to us. So uh, it's much, much less than a light year. It's only uh, eight light minutes. Okay, so that's what that first page is. And the second page is similar. I just, when, the, when my presentation was finished, I just went through it and wrote down the important mathematical relationships that came out of, uh, of that. We'll be talking about all of these relationships now as we go through our presentation. This is not everyone's cup of tea, but some of you I think might find this useful. And uh, we'll just let this, these pages grow each, with each presentation, I'll, I'll add to the sheet and send it out. Uh, it won't grow as fast uh, after a while. We'll have, uh, you know, our mathematical relationships as we go through the early presentations. Uh, so don't think that this thing will be filled with pages and pages of formulas. That's not my intention. But when we do finish, we'll have a very nice sheet of, uh, of, of constants of nature, of important numbers and values uh, in, in, in uh, the science of cosmology. So the first page, I think, will develop into something quite interesting uh, to have on one place all of the important numbers uh, that uh, we'll come across um, in, in our study. And so this is just the beginning of that. So it would be useful to keep track of this. And as I give you a, a, new, a new one, throw the old one away and <laughs> print out the new one uh, if, uh, if that's something which, which you find helpful. Okay, uh, how are we doing? Uh, I see there is a chat question. Let me go ahead and, uh, and do that. Can I do that? Why do I, I guess it's under more. This is why I like to have the other screen up because I can see it much more easily here. Let me do, let me read it here. I'm reading it here. Uh, um, is the universe shaped like <coughs> the cone uh, in the picture or is that just a graphic representation? So that is just a graphic rep representation uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of the time frames of the eras, the epics that we go through. Notice it's a very interesting picture. It starts at zero and ends at 13.8 billion years, which is a very big number. 
That's the age of the universe. And look at the middle. The middle is the first three minutes. Okay, so we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> if in this depiction, half of the diagram is taken up with the first three minutes. Obviously, a lot goes on uh, in the first three minutes of the model of the Big Bang that gets us started so that we, in fact, can predict uh, what the universe will look like. So this is, a, this is after all, a very, a very interesting picture. Okay, let's, let's move on. So I'd like to um, um, tell you about two of the most important discoveries of modern cosmology, really got cosmology started as a, a, as a science. And those two discoveries were done by Edward Hubble. And um, we'll look at his work and the work underneath his work, uh, the work that made his work possible for these two great discoveries. Uh, that's the that that that's our goal for today, and um, we'll 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 look at this uh, through an historic um, point of view. We'll kind of run very quickly up through the various views um, of the universe, coming up to the very radical new change that Hubble brought um, to that view uh, of the universe. So we'll start here by we'll use this device of uh, four basic questions that one can ask about the universe. It's been asked for all of historical time. It can even be asked by one of your precocious grandchildren. It's, some of these questions uh, could, could occur to him or her. Is the size of the universe finite or infinite? Is the time duration of the universe finite or infinite? Does it have a start? Does it have an end? Is the universe fundamentally unchanging or does it in fact evolve in time? And what is the position of us? What is our position uh, in the universe? Yeah, literally the physical position uh, of us in this thing that we see around us. So let's take a look uh, at, uh, at, at how these questions have been answered over time. We'll begin back uh, in the time of myth, uh, uh, early religions, they all had answers to these questions. And most cultural traditions held that the universe was in fact finite, bounded uh, by the dome of the world, by the, the dome of the sky the celestial sphere, as it was called by the Greeks. Most cultural traditions uh, held that the universe was created by some kind of divine power. It was did have a start somewhere. Um, and its duration was not generally uh, certain, for sure, an open question. Most cultural traditions held that the universe is fundamentally unchanging, at least after a short time in which the creation period uh, was over, very much like the Genesis story. But once the creation story was, was finished, the universe would then move on pretty much fundamentally unchanging is what is held by what you'll see, you would see in most cultural traditions and stories of cosmog cosmogony, it's the story of the beginning of the universe. And finally, most cultural traditions certainly held that the earth was the center of the universe. That's what it looks like from us today. And we sit in our lawn chair at night and look up, it looks like everything is surrounding us, moving around us. I want to focus now on our Western scientific tradition. That's where our course is embedded in. Um, so we're going to focus here just on that Western tradition. And by that Western tradition, I mean the tradition of the Egyptians and the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the, the great Muslim culture uh, <clears throat> of, the, of the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, uh, moving on up through Europe and the Renaissance and the scientific revolution, that tradition. Uh, <clears throat> the key start of that would, would be the ancient Greeks, where they held that the universe was founded, finite, I'm sorry, bounded by the fixed stars, the dome of the sky. Aristotle, great proponent, great example of the, of the scientific thinking in the Greek world, they came as representative. He felt that the universe was eternal fundamentally unchanging, and of course, the Earth was at the center of the universe. We move to the Christian view of the uh, late Middle Ages, and they adopted, for the most part, that cosmology of the ancient Greeks, with the very important change that uh, the exception of the divine creation coming from uh, the Genesis story. And that the age of the universe, therefore, from the Genesis story, had to be bounded 
and um, the time frame for the beginning of the world was somewhere in the order of like four or five thousand years, <clears throat> and uh, it was very much universally uh, understood and anticipated during that time that the world would come to an end sooner than later. That is, there was less time in front of us than there was behind us when God would call an end to this His creation and uh, and and bring it and bring it to its fruition uh, in whatever master plan that he had. So that was the late Middle Ages view of those uh, great questions. We move to the Renaissance and of course Copernicus uh, sends the earth revolving around the sun and spinning on its axis. So this is very interesting. Once the dome of the sky is no longer turning in unison because it's a fixed thing, but the reason why the, the uh, dome of the sky is turning is because we are turning on our axis. That then opens up the possibility that the stars are not all fixed on the same plane and only looks that way because of our motion. That opens up the possibility that the stars are not at a fixed distance away. 150 years later, when Galileo comes along with the telescope and he sees stars through his telescope that we can't see with our naked eye, and he starts, sees stars of different brightnesses and different dip, distances, he resolves the Milky Way, parts of it, into a myriad of stars. All of a sudden, that becomes a very real possibility that the stars are very much a different uh, distance away, all kinds of different distances, stretching back as far as who knows. The idea of possibly an infinite universe becomes for the first time a, a real empirical possibility with that. The age of the universe during the Renaissance was still calculated, getting a better idea uh, of this, uh, studying the genealogy of the Bible, of uh, so the Genesis book, uh, getting to about 6,000 years, and again, God would bring it uh, to an end, the universe to an end in less time than we had uh, <clears throat> before us. And the universe was held to be fundamentally unchanging. About 1700, we come to the end of the scientific revolution with Newton. He believed that the stars were pretty much just like the sun, uh, that they were distributed evenly through space, which is more or less what you see when you, when you look up, the stars look like they're more or less evenly distributed. Um, and um, it's interesting that he realized, given the universal law of gravity, that left to its own devices, the stars would eventually collapse in on themselves and get what we call in cosmology a big crunch, one of the possibilities uh, in the cosmological theories. It's interesting that Newton realized this from his law of gravity. And what he needed was God from time to time to kind of adjust things and tinker with things so that the universe would keep uh, in that nice, steady, static, unchanging state. Newton, as we know, spent more time studying uh, genealogy and things like that than he did physics, and so on by his own admission. And so he did, a, he did uh, some of these precise calculations to get the age of the universe to be about 6,000 years old. Moving another 100 years uh, to the late 1700s to the great William Herschel, greatest astronomer of his time, building the largest telescopes uh, of his time. He realized uh, in surveying the sky that the, the stars, in fact, were not evenly distributed, but the stars around us seemed to be in a kind of a, more or less of a disk shape. And he did consider us, certainly looks that way, that we in the solar system, the sun, was the center of that disk shape um, universe. It's interesting, Herschel was the first astronomer to introduce the process of evolution into the study of the stars. Because his telescope, he could look so far back in time, so far in great distance, and therefore he knew looking back in time, that the possibility that we're looking at stars of different ages, therefore different parts of their evolution, their, uh, their life cycle. He had this fundamental understanding that this was very possible. One of the things that he pointed to, uh, to support that, were the nebula, these gray, cloudy kind of things in the sky. He was interested in nebula as an amateur astronomer of his day. He was, he was a, a great amateur, not a professional. Professional astronomers were interested in the planets, the motion of the planets, 
They were interested in the individual stars, taking the most detailed measurements of the planets and the stars, the orbits of the planets. <clears throat> the Holy Grail at the time of Herschel was to try to find the distance to a star that was still not yet found. Um, but Herschel, as a as a uh, amateur, wasn't swayed by that. He was interested in the universe in general, as a whole. And so these nebula, uh, the nebulae, I guess pronounced in, in the plural, these cloudy kind of patches in the sky, he wondered what they were. One of, the, one of his thoughts was maybe they were clouds of gas in which stars were forming. Uh, and he began to catalog the nebula and put focus on it. And the world of astronomy began to pay attention to uh, this nebula and began to make great catalogs of them, wondering just what these grayish, cloudy kind of um, mushy things in the sky, nebula, of course, is the, comes from the word cloud, were. This is a Hubble picture. This is not what they what it looks like in uh, in Herschel's telescope or in um, in your amateur telescope. They'll just be kind of a cloudy mush without any any real structure. <clears throat> but he did introduce this idea of perhaps the stars had an ev evolution to them. Um, he gave us, he has a wonderful analogy about looking at a garden. So if you wanted to study how plants developed and you could only look, and you couldn't look throughout the whole, whole season from spring through fall, what you could do is you could study certain plants at one time that some had grown up early or now dying somewhere in the, you know, the middle of their growth, and some were just young spruits, uh, spruits, spruits. If you could see that just in one garden, then you could get an understanding of how that particular plant evolved over the, over the growing season. He made the exact same analogy by looking back in time with his telescope to look at the different evolution of the stars, if we could figure out what these nebula were. So it was an intriguing idea uh, about a changing, a changing universe. He was complimented at the same time uh, by just pure speculation, without any scientific background at all, of the great astron, uh, the great uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant. He put forth for the first time the nebula hypothesis, the famous hypothesis about the evolution of the solar system, the sun starting with a big cloud of gas and <clears throat> forming and starting to, to rotate and the sun uh, coagulating in the middle and beginning to burn and the other pieces being broken off and forming other planets. And he laid this all out with pure speculation and this was picked up by the astronomers and the physics of his day. And people began to work on this actually using the law of gravity. And uh, this made a lot of sense. This is still one of the most important theories today of the evolution of, of planets in the large picture has been greatly modified since, since this very vague idea, but it's, uh, it's still with us today. A very radical idea that here the sun and the earth was not always here, uh, but in fact had to evolve in this kind of way from a big cloud of gas. <clears throat> very radical idea. Interesting though, uh, both these processes that both Herschel and uh, Kant are talking about, first of all, realize these are local events, right? These are just things that are happening with individual stars, whether they can form into stars with planets around them or they can go through a certain life cycle. This is not really changing the general nature of the universe as a whole. Still very much entrenched as an idea <clears throat> is that the universe as a whole is not fundamentally changing. The other thing, of course, that the idea of evolution brings is that, that, that clearly that we need vast amounts of time for these things to happen. Look at that picture above on the right of the developing of the universe, uh, I'm sorry, developing of the solar system. Clearly this doesn't happen in six days. <clears throat> so we need a much longer time frame than was uh, accepted uh, up until this point. And uh, as things would have it, uh, the great, um, <clears throat> um, um, geologist uh, Charles Lyell, in his uh, monumental work, The Principles of Geology in the 1830s, did in fact show, gave great convincing uh, evidence looking at the fossil record that the natural ongoing processes that we see on the earth do take millions of years to develop. And so all of a sudden the time frame 
uh, becomes something that, that is possible. Moving on to the uh, 1900s, beginning of the 1900s, um, view of most scientists was that the universe is infinite in extent. Uh, although there was no direct proof of this, um, the alternative view of some kind of a bounded universe where there was a wall somewhere or something where the universe would stop was not philosophically uh, attractive. And so although it seemed to be the most reasonable thing that given the fact that all these distances as they were being measured more and more, people began to measure distances successfully, um, that there would seem to be no bound to, to these distances. And uh, certainly very much entrenched through the whole 19th century uh, and into the early part of the 20th century that the universe is fundamentally unchanging on the largest scale. Yes, the, under, the uh, understanding of the evolution of, of stars and stars having a life cycle <clears throat> and the uh, evolution even of, uh, of solar systems. Yes, many things were going on. There were births of stars, there was uh, novas and supernovas, there was uh, the blowing up of stars. This was understood, but these were all, again, local events. <clears throat> if you took a step back, very far back, and looked at the universe as a whole, it was believed by most scientists, without a question, that in general, on the largest scale, the universe was essentially unchanging. A view that really has never has been going on now since the beginning of our story, a very deeply entrenched, just part of our, of our Western <coughs> scientific um, tradition. In the early 1900s, Harold Shapley uh, is actually able to do a, a more detailed survey with modern, uh, modern telescopes, modern ideas of the shape of our surrounding stars. And he found that disk shape uh, of Herschel was in fact indeed true. Um, he found that there was the, the central Milky Way that we see in the sky was actually the center, center bulge of stars in this great system of stars that we are in. He expanded the size of this great system to be about 10 times larger than was thought before with his more detailed measurements. And in fact, he was able to show, and we'll show this next Friday, that the sun is in fact not at the center of this great um, system of stars, but was actually about halfway out from the center. Uh, and this was kind of pushing finally, <clears throat> once and for all, moving the earth away from even the solar system, away from the center of the universe. Because he did believe that this enormous uh, set of stars and nebula and everything else that you could see was all one big gravitational system all under the control of that central bulge, that this was in fact the universe. Um, in terms of time, around that same time, around the turn of the century with the discovery of radioactivity, one of the great applications first put to use of half-life uh, done by one of the founders of radioactivity, uh, Rutherford, he showed that using, uh, studying the half-life of minerals uh, and atoms, that some of the rocks of the earth could be measured in the order of 500 million to 1.6 billion years old. And given the uh, uh, nebula hypothesis of the evolution of the earth as part of the evolution of the sun, clearly the universe had to be older than, <clears throat> than the earth, older than the sun, or at least as old. So we're, we're expanding the time frame of the universe here in leaps and bounds. And we finally come to the point of our story, <clears throat> uh, and that is the birth of the modern universe with uh, the discoveries of Edmund Hubble. <clears throat> in 1923, Hubble showed that the distance to the Andromeda Nebula was of tremendous size. He found this by finding the distance to one star, one particular star in that nebula. <clears throat> He found that the distance to that star and therefore to the Andromeda Nebula was beyond any measurement that we knew beforehand uh, in terms of looking at individual stars and what we call the Milky Way. This was something beyond all of that. And I want to tell you that story 
We want to go through uh, the physics involved in that, and we will come across, introduce some of the most important ideas that will hold us in good stead throughout our entire course here. He did this using uh, the great Hooker uh, telescope up from Mount Wilson, the 100 inch telescope, the largest telescope in the world at that time. There's a picture of it. There's a great, uh, I recommended a great video about the Mount Wilson Observatory and the history that's there with the great telescope. There's um, Hubble sitting at the telescope. You, naively, you would think he's looking through the telescope. <laughs> he's not, he's looking at, through a spotoscope to spot um, what the part of the sky he wants to see. No one looks through a telescope like this. <clears throat> uh, that's reserved for cameras and uh, spectroscopes. You don't sit and look through the hooker yourself. Um, but it, it, it is a great picture, but you do have to sit, as is shown in that video, you do have to sit and look through the spotoscopes and, and see what, what patch of the sky you're looking at. And then it, the, the telescope and lock in on that patch <clears throat> and continue to, to observe it over many, many hours as the dome rotates. So here is a view of the great Andromeda, which we now of course call a galaxy, but up until this time was one of those intriguing nebula. And this is a Hubble picture of it, Hubble space uh, scope uh, picture uh, of it. And this is where he found this special star. So let's take a look uh, at that, that story. <clears throat> How you measure um, distance, excuse me, turn this thing off. Um, how you measure distance, uh, for short distances, remote distances, one can use parallax. A very familiar idea of what surveyors use. Uh, you can have a known baseline be, take measurements from the opposite sides of the baseline uh, to the base uh, of the tree and using a little bit of trigonometry, having the angles uh, and having the length of the baseline, you can calculate that distance D. And this is the way surveyors make maps still today. Astronomers do the same thing. The baseline that they use is the astronomical unit, right? They have the Earth going around the sun, so we're on one side of the sun in January, we're on the other side of the sun in July. Uh, and so looking at a star, just like looking at a tree, we're looking at it from two different sides of the baseline. And again, taking angle measurements, uh, knowing the, the distance of one uh, astronomical unit, that 93 million miles, um, one can use trigonometry and find the distance to the star. Well, this is great. Uh, sounds like a big baseline, about 200 million uh, miles. Sounds like a pretty decent baseline, but not in terms of cosmology, okay? Even with uh, a, a, a space-based um, uh, telescope in, in orbit around the Earth, you can only get out to about 300 uh, light years using this device. 300 light years, guys, is not gonna get us anywhere in our study of cosmology. It's not even a stone's throw. So if we're going to measure distances like what uh, Hubble did, uh, found, he found the distance to Andromeda to be 1 million light years. And this parallax, even using the, the best uh, telescopes uh, in, in orbit, which of course <laughs> Hubble did not have at his time, it can only get out to 300 light years. He could get out in parallax of his day, maybe 100 light years at best. Um, how do you get from 100 light years to a million light years? Clearly you need something different. You need a wholly different idea than this business of parallax and measuring angles. Some other concept has to be brought in uh, to measure these kinds of great distances. And that's what I want to, uh, that's what I want to, to, to tell you. So let's take a look at that physics. It starts here by looking at how the brightness of light changes, how the apparent brightness of light changes as the light moves further and further away from us. As you double the, the distance away from a light source, its brightness will go down by a fourth, one over two. If you triple that distance, the distance becomes three times the distance of your, that original distance The brightness will now be one ninth of that, uh, of that source. All right. Um, <clears throat> So this is a property uh, of light, very well-known property of light goes back to even to, to the time of Newton. We can use this property because the brightness of light 
the brightness that we see, therefore we can say is inversely proportional to the distance squared. As the distance gets bigger and bigger, the brightness goes down by one over the distance squared, as this picture shows, from being the one fourth and the one ninth. Okay. Obviously, also the brightness of the light that we see, the apparent brightness as it's called, is also proportional to the true brightness, what we call the luminosity of the object. Clearly, as the true brightness of something gets brighter and brighter, it will appear to us brighter and brighter, given everything else being equal. So we can say that the brightness of the light, the apparent brightness that we see, that we can measure, for example, with a photometer from a modern camera, uh, that brightness uh, is both proportional to the true luminosity and inversely proportional to the distance squared. This is a fundamental relationship. This is the relationship that will allow us to measure things to one uh, million light years. Okay. This is kind of a quasi equation. The equation itself is more complicated than this, but this is the part of the mathematical relationship. Okay, just so if you start to put this into numbers, the equation becomes more complicated than a simple proportion. But the idea is that the brightness is proportional to its inherent luminosity. It is inverse proportional to how far away it is squared. <clears throat> so we can turn this quasi equation around and we can say that the luminosity is proportional to the brightness and the distance squared. And that makes sense. Certainly the brighter uh, something looks, you would think, all things being equal, it must be really bright. And the brighter it gets to our eye, this is luminosity should be growing. And also as the distance, given the brightness being the same, if the distance is getting larger and larger, and yet the brightness is staying the same, well, then this thing must be very, very bright, okay? Because we know it's so far away. If the distance is very great, L must be very, 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 very big because the, the, the brightness is basically staying the same uh, as the distance grows. This thing must be very, very bright to be that, this, that, that apparent brightness at such a larger distance. And the one that we're really after, the important one is this one, that the distance is proportional to, again, because of the square, the square root of the, uh, the uh, absolute brightness over the apparent brightness. The square root sign is not important. That's kind of a dampening factor. We can ignore that conceptually. And the distance is proportional to the luminosity, the true brightness of the object divided by the apparent brightness. It's a fraction, okay? Think of this fraction. This is, this is one of the key concepts of our entire course. And think of the fraction as being greater than one. That means the true luminosity is greater than the apparent brightness. This thing is very, very bright, we know for some reason, compared to its, the brightness that we see. But what does that mean? Okay? If, the, if this thing is very, we know it's very, very bright, but it doesn't look all that bright. It must be far away. That is when the fraction is greater than one, the distance is growing. If something we know is very, very bright, but it doesn't look all that bright, the only explanation is the D must be large. And taking the fraction the other way, if the fraction is less than one, that means the denominator is big. If this thing looks very, very bright, but we know it's not all that bright, okay? But it looks awful bright, but we know it's really not all that bright well, then it must be very close. It must be closer to us than we realize. If we took a 100 watt bulb and put it up to our nose, not at our nose, we don't want to burn our nose, this thing would look very, very bright only because it's very close. So if you know the true brightness of something, and we always can know the apparent brightness, we can just measure it with a meter, okay? We can, if we see it, we know it's apparent brightness, that we always know. But if we have some way of knowing the true brightness of something, and we can compare that to its apparent brightness, we can calculate the distance because of the physics of how the brightness of light falls off. This is the other idea. This is the idea that we're going to use to find distances to a million light years. We're going to take a look at the Andromeda Nebula 
certainly see its apparent brightness. That's for free. We just look at it through the telescope and we have devices which can measure what it apparently looks like. If we could find a way to know what it really is, what its real brightness is, then we could use this relationship to calculate the distance. That's our game. Okay. So let's see how this works out. Before we go, let's just take a look uh, at, uh, at, at an application of this. On the left, you're looking at the great dog star, right? With Sirius, the brightest star in the sky is there. You can see the dog is very cute. See, there's the head of the dog and the tail, and, and there's Sirius. This is the apparent brightness, what we see in the sky. And there is no star brighter than Sirius. Take a look at this star right here. This star right here is incredibly bright. This star here is this star here. Here's Sirius, okay? When we look at its, the true brightnesses, we compare these stars for true brightness, Sirius shrinks. It's still a bright star, but it's nothing compared to these other stars. Why do they look so dim? Why does this star look so dim and look how true its true brightness is? This star must be very, very far away if it's this kind of brightness. That's this relationship between brightness and the uh, true brightness, apparent brightness, and distance. Let's look at it one more time. It's such an important concept. Allow me to beat it to death. Here are, the bri here are some uh, bright objects in our sky. Brightest object in our sky, obviously, by far is the sun. Don't worry about these numbers. These are, these are magnitude numbers. We're not gonna worry about these. Here's Sirius, brightest star on the sky. Here's Vega, slightly less bright <coughs> star, Altair. Here's the North Star, Polaris. Okay. This is a magnitude two star as opposed to a magnitude zero star for Vega. And here's the Andromeda galaxy. It's even dimmer. It's a magnitude 3.5. This is something we can see very, very barely with good eyes on a, on a dark night here up here in New Hampshire. You have to know exactly where to look. Not all that bright. Now let's look at their brightness relative to the sun. Okay. Calling the sun's brightness one, Sirius is a bright star. Okay. It's 22 times brighter um, than the sun. Okay. It's obviously much dimmer than the sun because it's so far away. It's 8.6 light years away. Now look at Vega. Vega is even dimmer than Sirius, but it's 50 times brighter than the sun. It's more than twice as bright as Sirius. Well, it's more than twice as far away. Okay. Yes, it has a great in inherent luminosity of 50, but it's 25 light years away compared to only eight. So it's not as bright in terms of how we see it. And finally, we may be surprised that the North Star is very, very bright. It is not the brightest star in the sky by far. It's only a two magnitude star. It's actually, I think, the 25th brightest star in the sky, I think. But it is incredibly bright. It is over 2,000 times brighter than the sun. Well, why is it only a measly two magnitude star? Because it's 400 light years away. It's significantly bright, uh, further away than all these other stars. It's a different order of magnitude. And finally, we come to the extreme case, which will make, which will make the point. Here we have the dimmest object here in our list, the whole Andromeda galaxy. It is 15 billion times brighter than the sun, but yet we can hardly see it using binoculars if you know where to look. Why is something that's 15 times billion, 15 billion times brighter than the sun so dim? Because it's 2.2 million light years away. Okay. So this is this relationship down here, guys. The brightness of the light that we see is both proportional to its true luminosity and inversely proportional to its distance. This fundamental relationship is what we're going to use uh, to calculate uh, our distance. Okay. If you want to know what the real formula is that's used, you're not going to like it. Luckily, we're not going to use it. If we actually turn these things into these numbers, these magnitude numbers, and this, this is the, uh, the formula that is used. The absolute magnitude, the measure of the absolute brightness is equal to the apparent magnitude, a measure of the apparent brightness uh, minus five times the log of that distance over 32.6. I told you you weren't going to like it. We don't need it. We just need this conceptual idea. But this we do need. This we do need. 
Okay. <clears throat> Given that, we now can look at that special star, that special kind of star that uh, Hubble found. <clears throat> that special kind of star is called the Cepheid variable. The first one that was ever discovered was in the uh, uh, constellation Cephas, the great king, queen being Cassiopeia, uh, their daughter being Andromeda. Okay, And this star here, the fourth star in Cephas, Delta, was the first star in the 1700s that was discovered to be this pulsating star. And its light curve would go up and down and up and down in a very regular, regular way. Something like this. The light uh, is, is at its dimmest, then it rises rather quickly to a peak, then falls a little bit slower than it rises. Goes back to, to its low, again, same curve, rises up to that same peak, same time frame, and then uh, dims down a little bit slower than it, than, than it got right. We can measure this period, and different of these variable stars have different periods. And this was well known. No one actually knew why this was happening. Um, turns out that the speculation at the time turned out to be correct, that these stars actually pulsate. They actually get bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller, and that's what leads to their, uh, their changing uh, apparent brightness. <clears throat> and of course, given the fact that they're not changing their distance, they're just sitting there in the sky, more or less, if they're changing their apparent brightness, we know they must be changing their true luminosity uh, in this kind of way. So these were the famous Seaford variables known for a very long time. We come now to Henrietta Swan Leavitt. And she worked in the Harvard uh, uh, Observatory uh, as what was called at the time a computer. A wonderful biography of her, that short video, I encourage everyone to watch it. Uh, she was hired as one of the computers, uh, the, 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 the women who were good at math, usually they were math majors, and they were hired, they couldn't touch the telescopes, <laughs> God forbid, but they could take the data, they could take the plates, the photographic plates and the other data that was taken, and they could go ahead and massage that data um, using slide rules and uh, uh, adding machines and, uh, and just simple pad and paper to, uh, to accumulate this data. She was tasked by her boss to go ahead and study the variable stars in a particular area of the sky, the Large Magellan Cloud. Okay, we see it here. Uh, these are the two kind of dwarf galaxies that are very close to us, uh, relatively speaking, much closer than Andromeda, something like two to 300 light years away. And she was tasked to study uh, the plates that were coming down each night uh, of, the, of the Large Magellan Cloud and to see if she could find variable stars in that, in that cloud, in that, in that nebula. Plus at the time, she, no one knew that this was a galaxy. This was just another nebula. What she did was she took plates from one night and another night, and she was, had what's called a blinker that they could swiftly look from one plate to the other. And you could see if there was a change on the plate, something was blinking at you, <clears throat> that there was a change uh, in the star pattern. And there you could identify uh, a change of some sort. She was looking for stars that were changing in, in, in their brightness. She found 1,777 of these stars, and they imagined thousands and thousands of plates that she was handed. Imagine each morning when she came on her desk, there was another stack of plates uh, from, from, uh, developed from, from the night before um, studying this thing. But she went further. She had, she had a, 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 a greater interest as the great scientist that she was. She not only identified these stars, but she also, of course, could see their periods. She watched them over the entire cycle. And she began to record the periods of these stars. Now realize these stars are all essentially at the same distance away, right? They're all in this cloud. It's a big cloud, yes, but compared to the distance to the Earth, very, very small. The cloud is, you know, relatively small in its expansion. So all these stars are the same distance away. And she's looking at the period of these different brightness of stars. And this is what she found. This graph. One of the most important graphs in the history of astronomy. She found a simple relationship between the period of these variable stars and what their apparent brightness was. Yes, they looked brighter the long, at their peak the longer their period was. 
Now, since they're all at the same distance, right, the apparent brightness is a simple proxy of their absolute brightness because the distances are all the same. So she knew that the period of the variable star was a key to their absolute brightness. So for example, if she found a, a, uh, a star uh, which had a, bright, uh, a period of, 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 of 10 days, and then she found a, a star that had a period of 20 days, she knew that that star of 20 days was twice as bright for real as the star um, and that only had 10 days. But of course, she had no distances at the time. However, eventually one could take this relationship, find distances of stars not in the Magellan cloud, which was too far away for that technology, but variable stars closer to her, like the first star that was, that was discovered, like for example, the North Star. Yeah, nice crossword puzzle question. The North Star is a Seaford variable. It's so dim for us. I mean, it is so minor, the change that we can't pick up with our naked eye but the North Star is in fact a Seaford variable. <clears throat> and this relationship can then be turned into what's now called Levitt's Law, that the absolute brightness of a Seaford variable is directly proportional to its period, okay? So, <clears throat> by the way, um, so, uh, an example. Suppose that we found a Seaford variable uh, with a period of 10 days, and you could measure how far away that was, not in the Magellan clouds, but something close. And all of a sudden you found what its brightness was. Just take a number, like one, had a brightness of one. Then you went ahead and found another star, <clears throat> which had a period also of 10 days, and you found it to be a, the quarter brightness. Its brightness, its apparent brightness was one fourth of what, uh, of what the other 10 day period Seaford variable was. If it was one fourth as bright, you knew it was twice as far away. That's the law, okay? But the period tells us, Levitt's law tells us they have the same absolute brightness. They have the same absolute brightness, but if I know the apparent brightness of one and, that's dis and its distance, I can go ahead and calculate the true brightness from that relationship. And that's what was eventually done uh, once this law was, was unearthed by uh, Henrietta Swan Levin. So we finally turn our attention to what, uh, the, uh, the, 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 what the stage is set for. We go back to Herschel's uh, um, nebula, okay? Very intriguing. People study them more and more. Here's a set of pictures. Here's a picture from a telescope from 1840, the biggest telescope of its day. These, of course, are drawings. There's no photography uh, there. Here's a, here's a picture uh, in the early 1900s, um, and then, of course, a Hubble picture of probably the most famous nebula uh, in the sky, the Crab Nebula. By the way, even this picture here in the middle is not what you would see uh, through an amateur telescope. All you would see is a mushy gray cloud. That you wouldn't even see this kind of structure, not unless you had uh, uh, the telescope of this day, which was the largest telescope, refractor telescope of its day. So remember, you're looking just at really mushy clouds uh, until you get a very powerful telescopes. So here is that, the, here is the, the fellow who made that picture uh, of the early uh, telescope. Here's his biggest telescope, the 72 inch telescope still there as a uh, in Ireland it's a museum piece now uh, one can go see it uh, and his interest in building such a large telescope even bigger than the Herschel telescopes was to study um, the uh, nebula and uh, here's a, a very famous picture of the Whirlpool nebula uh, that he took with his big big telescope and he thought he could resolve this again this is a drawing but he thought looking through his telescope, and now you really did stare, stare through the telescope, there was no camera, he thought he could see individual stars in this swirling mass of clouds. Turns out he really couldn't, but he thought he could. And he thought he was looking at a system of stars that was clearly very far away because it was almost impossible, he thought, to resolve the stars. So they had to be very, very far away. 
And this was something perhaps outside of the Milky Way. Here's a picture by the great James Keeler, one of the great pioneers of astrophotography, an 1899 picture using again that Lick 36 refractor. Even here, you cannot resolve the individual stars of this galaxy. This galaxy is about 30 million light years away, far, far uh, just more distant than Andromeda. So th this was not, a, a, a not the right uh, subject to take. People realized that Andromeda had a, had a much more of a resolving power. Andromeda had to be closer. Another star, another nebula that seemed to be close was the Trianium. Uh, these were star nebula that you could resolve into individual stars. So these became the subject uh, of great scrutiny. Here's where people began to try to look at individual stars in these nebula to see if they could find something that they could measure the distance to these things. Were these island universes or were these just you know, large collections of stars within the bulge, within the gravitational power of the Milky Way. That was the great question of the day. And we've come then to Hubble. Hubble in 1923 was studying the Andromeda Nebula, looking through his plates uh, that he took every night. And he was started out by looking for Nova, again, by this blinking technique of looking at plate from one night to another. He was looking at things would all of a sudden burst uh, into, into view. Uh, there was a lot of research being done on NOVA, the light curve of NOVA, how the light grew, how it dimmed. Uh, maybe something could be ascertained as to the true brightness of the NOVA by looking at its light curve. <clears throat> but to his great delight and surprise in looking through NOVA, he actually discovered a Seaford variable. And that's the famous notation up here. He crossed out what he first thought was a nova and looking at it over many, many nights, many, many mornings in the day, by looking at his plates, he realized that this was a variable star. This was a Seaford variable. And he had, uh, well, I'm sorry, here's an here's a interesting picture. Here's the Hubble picture uh, of the Andromeda Nebula. Here's his plate here, the famous, where he crosses out and writes law. Here's the area in the Hubble picture of his picture. And here's this little patch here. This is this patch in the Hubble. There's that star. <laughs> There's the famous uh, Seaford variable that uh, Hubble, Hubble found in this picture uh, to measure the period of the star. And that's what he could do. By measuring the period of that tiny star in the Andromeda Nebula, what could he do? He could turn to Levitt's law from the period he knew the absolute magnitude of the star because of the calibration done years before by looking at Seaford variables of known distance. He, you could hook up the known distances to periods. Once he had the period, he then knew what the absolute magnitude of that star was. Well, you always get the apparent magnitude. By the way, it was a very, very dim star. It was only of magnitude 18. Not magnitude one, not magnitude two, like, like the North Star, magnitude 18 could only be seen by the great Hooker telescope in, up in Mount Wilson. But knowing the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude, yeah, he could measure the distance. And he found that distance to be one million light years. A distance beyond anything that, uh, that was measured before unprecedented uh, distance. This was truly an island universe. And this changed forever our view of the universe. That in fact, this nebula was not just some cloudy mass, wasn't even a cloudy mass, just cloudy mass of stars. It was a whole system of stars totally independent of our local system of stars. It was its own galaxy. And not surprisingly, this is the closest galaxy to us. This was the easiest one to find because we could resolve stars using the Mount Wilson telescope uh, in, 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 in that nebula. And luckily, he found a Seaford variable. And without Henrietta Leavitt's work, he never would have been able to uh, know that that was the key to finding the distance to, to the nebula. By the way, to his credit, um, um, 
Hubble always gave uh, credit to Levitt for that work, uh, the, for the foundational work that allowed him to make that great discovery. He always gave her credit for that and actually lobbied that she should uh, be awarded a Nobel Prize. Uh, so he gets a lot of credit for doing that in that during that in that time frame in, the, in that in that age uh, where here we have a woman who wasn't even allowed to uh, to work uh, in the observatory itself. Um, um, and the story goes, as you may have seen in the in the biography, that finally the um, Nobel Prize Committee got around to recognizing the importance of this work uh, of Levitt and wanted to give her the, the Nobel Prize and tried to contact her uh, and uh, found from her family that she had died three years earlier. Um, and it's a policy of the Nobel Prize Committee not to give posthumous uh, Nobel Prizes. They should be given to living scientists, that's their policy. And so um, she uh, uh, did not get the Nobel Prize, but clearly was recognized by the entire scientific community that her work was of Nobel quality uh, uh, caliber. Okay, well, we're, we're running out of time. We're now set to, now that we have the distance of galaxies, not only the Andromeda galaxy, but by finding seafood variables in other galaxies, we can go ahead and find distances to further and further uh, galaxies. Seafood variables can work for about 30 million light years. Not bad. Huh? Uh, they're bright enough that you can see them through big, powerful telescopes to about 30 million light years. And that's what Hubble set out to do. He set out to find the, the uh, seafood variables in more and more galaxies and go ahead and catalog their distances. And so he was building a catalog of distances um, to, 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 to galaxies. <clears throat> but we need one other piece of the story uh, before we get to his second great discovery of the expanding universe. We have to understand how those distances to the galaxies are related to their spectra. And that's where we will end here and we will pick up the very end of our story um, next time. Okay, so uh, let me uh, unmute everybody. Can I do that? Uh, okay, you can un you can unmute yourself, everybody. Uh, let me close this down. No. Uh, Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, we have just a, a couple of minutes left. Uh, are there any questions? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 We can. yes. A question. In chat. No. Okay. But did, did, I, did I miss anything in chat? I think I did. Before you go, let me see if I can do a quick read. Uh, did Herschel realize that he was indeed looking back in time? Very good question. Yes, that's why he in, in, introduced this idea of evolution. He realized, of course, uh, that light being of a finite speed, that was well known in Newton's time, uh, that light had a finite speed, that as you look back in distance, that that, that object took longer and longer to reach uh, the Earth. So he knew he was looking back in time, and that's what allowed him to ha have that wonderful analogy of looking at a garden. And the third question is, uh, my, my voice is breaking up. Okay, you know, guys, I'm thinking I'm going to find a way to not use the second monitor next time. It just puts too much of a burden on my bandwidth. I'm going to have to figure out, I'm going to have to practice how to look at the chat uh, just through my own screen. Um, so I will figure that out. All right. Well, guys. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we're all we're all together and we finally got started. Um, and um, I'll, I'll see you next time. I'm going to end the recording and uh, end the session. All right. Um, see you next week. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Alrighty. Have a good oh. week, everybody.